go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our global Hacking HR community. It is just terrific to have you all here. I'm Michelle Tenzik. I'm the CEO and founder of East 10th Group, coming to you from New York City. And we have our esteemed panelists, Paul Estes from Maven and Oak today. We have Diane um, Finkhausen from Social Works. Did I get that right, Diane? And we have Carrie Brown, I'm so sorry, from SAP. So I just needed to turn off, unfortunately, my phone. I did not have it on mute, so it was a little bit hard to hear what was going on here. But we are going to be talking today about getting the global workforce ready for the future of work. And our panel, I will like to say right up front, is we actually feel the future of work is now that we're already in it and it's now and also for the future. And please chime in on LinkedIn for where you're uh, dialing in from and where you're listening from because we'd love to learn from you and hear from you. So with that, Paul, Diane, Carrie, are we ready to go? Absolutely. Do it. Fantastic. So Carrie, I'm actually gonna start with you if that's okay. Um, you're in an organization of 100,000 employees across the world huge role. I'd love for you to talk about when we were prepping for this, you talked about talent today in terms of getting ready. They also have a choice about what it means to get ready and where they should be. Could you just expand upon that? What does that mean for our audience and what are some of your thinking and insights on that? Absolutely. So the employee experience now is, is vital in terms of engagement, retention, uh, capturing the organization and talent. And one of the observations I've made recently is if you look at the baby boomer population who is you know, at the point in their career where they have a lot of choice because they have established themselves well enough to really say, what do I want to do with my last five, 10 years? And similarly, you have a large population of millennials or even Gen Z coming in who have a lot of choice because they haven't committed to something yet and don't have necessarily the expectations of staying with an organization a long, long time and have a lot of ideal, um, you know, idealistic thoughts and, and early thoughts around their careers. So making choices actively. So that really ends us up with about 75% of the population who's making choices and really making active choices. And if they don't like what they're seeing, they don't like what they're doing, they're going to change and shift. And so the onus really on the organizations is to create an environment where they can grow and stay engaged and need to do that in order to keep the talent that they want. Yeah, because I think, and I'd love, Paul, for you to, to chime in on that part, right? Um, we talked about sort of, you know, people needing to be the CEO of themselves in this now current, you know, readiness of what work is today. So thinking about, you know, what Carrie just shared about 75% really have choice. Paul, if, if we're thinking about them being the CEO of themselves, how does that tie in and what does that mean in this getting ready stage that we're in? Thanks, thanks Michelle. First, I wanted to correct something. I, I'm the editor-in-chief of staffing.com. So if you look at, look at my role, we just launched an amazing uh, website, staffing.com. And Thank uh, you, Paul. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, I think one of the things that Kara said is really interesting. When you look at the millennials and Gen Z, they're digital natives. So, so making a brand of themselves is natural. You know, they go to Instagram and they do it almost without thinking. They curate a brand, they have, you know, brand colors and features and, and have a voice that's theirs and they, they publish content regularly. When I, when I look at folks that are, you know, between 35 and let's say 55 in their careers, that idea of making your brand and deciding who you are and figuring out your voice and putting yourself out there in social media and writing articles and doing all of those things that help keep you engaged and also hang your shingles so that you can, you know, like Carrie said, have choice and, and, and get projects and move into more of a consulting or independent work phase doesn't come naturally. And so one of the things that I've noticed as I've worked with lots of people is how do you train people? to become a brand? How do you train them to be comfortable, you know, posting out on the internet? I remember the first time that even I wrote a LinkedIn article and I wrote it and I 
you know, everybody reviewed it. And I checked my spelling, my mom, my wife, and, and everybody. And I sat there at the computer and I, I remember the publish button. And I was about to publish it and I was scared. And I, I actually didn't. I waited a bit. And so, you know, it, and now once I published, the reaction was fantastic. And people started reaching out. And now you can't stop me from publishing stuff on LinkedIn. But, but I empathize with those that are going through this, this journey for the first time. And so I think Carrie is on to something that there, there are two parts. You know, it's not just millennials and Gen Z looking for purpose and wanting flexibility. And so I'm glad she framed it that way because it's, it's really important. So when you look at the talent economy, as we call it, mm -hmm. talent has a choice. People have a choice now. And so organizations who don't embrace that choice, who don't embrace on demand and flexibility are going to be, you know, having people that may not be the best for their organization and, and they'll okay. suffer. So I think that's why we're here and what we're talking about today. Yeah. Diane, I want, I want to turn to you for a minute. And, you know, especially as we just talked about sort of the, the talent ecosystem, right? What's going on with overall the talent out there and how are individuals, you know, readying themselves and being prepared now? I know that you've got a big belief around the quote unquote ecosystem, right? And the systems that support that ecosystem in organizations to prop all of us up as individuals. Talk a little bit about that to us. Sure, sure. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, you know, the, the world is, we're all feeling it. The world is speeding up, it's opening up, and it's resourcing up. Um, the talent today is a much more fluid and accessible resource for businesses, and, uh, and it's also a much more empowered resource. Mm -hmm. Really, um, I, I believe that the, the winners in, you know, the digital, digital era are going to be those that, that really harness ecosystems and platforms in a way that both optimizes business performance, but also elevates the human experience. Um, really, technology, we're, we're all getting hit with that um, kind of that digital tsunami, if you will, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and trying to figure out what it means for us at the organizational level and at the individual level. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, what we've heard from the, the panel so far is that um, we need to help uh, our, our teams really kind of arm themselves for the digital era in a way that um, that really empowers them and positions them for greater greater reward and greater success. Mm -hmm. um, ecosystems, uh, expert ecosystems are are now extending well beyond the boundaries of the organization. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as as HR professionals, we need to solve for that and solve for the enrichment of that expert ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting. I was reading an article this morning. I do a lot of work with boards and it was really talking about how does how our board of directors really get ready for what's going on today. What do they have to pay attention to? But in reading the article, I think this is interesting. And Carrie, I'm going to turn to you on this because it, you know, it has to do with remote programs. And I know that's a favorite topic of yours. But um, what I was reading is in terms of machine learning and AI and all of these things that we all know are here already and will be here to stay is there's such availability today online, Coursera, through other methodologies, to really arm yourself quite easily on getting up to speed with a lot of these technologies that is about readying the global workforce that we all have to become much more savvy around, in addition to, of course, having strong soft skills, which will be really called upon. But I know that also a lot of us, in terms of the current work environment, we're very, like today, this is a global community. I've seen people chime in from Nigeria, from Germany, from Peru, Chicago, New York. Welcome to all of you. And to me, that just says we are global, we are virtual, and yet we're working. So with all of those pieces, Carrie, I know this is a big, like your heart and soul on the remote program. So share with us what you're seeing, especially at an SAB, 100,000 employees. Yep and how you're managing for that in that environment. So we are significantly remote in terms of working. So I've been at SAP 15 years and I've never had a desk. And when I worked prior to that, I was at Coca-Cola and it mattered where my desk was compared to my colleagues. And so mm -hmm. a very, very different kind of culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, it definitely, um, you know, for us, 
And I think for a lot of remote cultures, it's about self-initiative and that the idea of being the CEO of yourself and, and taking the time to, to move ahead. You know, I know, Michelle, talking to you, your organization runs on Slack. I've come across other organizations where their entire organization is remote and mm -hmm. they don't even have a place of, of business, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting what we looked at a few years ago, we said like, how do jobs change based on digital? And was it just a sexy word or was it really shifting? And it's interesting to take call center reps as an example. We looked at the persona for that to say, how are businesses adapting based on the way people work and what they want? And if you look at the engagement, as Paul said, in social media as a constant part of your life all the time now, you know, historically call center reps would go have a life, go into a cube, deal with their customer base to have the good customer service, get let out for a break, get let out for lunch, and then, you know, go home and, and re-engage with life. And as social media has shifted, people are much more fluid between their personal and their professional lives. Mm -hmm. As an example, um, the Canadian Automobile Association has actually created rush hour only shifts that are remote. And wow. so workers from all the way across Canada can be a call center rep instead of needing to actually fight rush hour to get to that job, to help people with it. You know, so they're using uh, predictive analytics and they're doing anywhere, anytime work with a phone and a computer and they win, the customers win, the talent journey and the talent fight, you know, they have more options to play in that game. So it's something that used to feel unfamiliar. I think certainly depending on your business and how to measure is the right work getting done. Cultures are either more or less comfortable with having somebody that they can see and touch um, or what kind of coaching that they want to be giving people. But candidly, it's, you know, if you're getting the right work done, there's no reason you can't do it anywhere, anytime. Yeah, I think, I think that's just such a great point. And I want to welcome Tim, um, our fifth panelist, who just was able to join us. Tim, we'll get Perfect to you. Perfect timing, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I think, Tim, actually, I am going to ask you to chime in here, is with what Carrie is talking about, you know, she's never had a desk in 15 years. That certainly is the way of the world now. My whole team is virtual. And I think what's interesting about that is we're a team of 14, and Carrie's part of a team of 100,000. And so we're two very different sized companies, yet we are both very virtual in the work that we're doing. But Tim, I know one of the things that you like to talk about is really what are the learning programs then that can be customized, right, for those really grand groups of individuals who are working remotely and are managing the remote workers at the same time? And where does the learning come in? And what can, again, if we're getting everyone ready, which again, our panel believes we're there. So it's not about getting ready. It's like you're in it now. But what do you do learning wise? I mean, how, how do you get people who are resistance to change? Paul, you and I talked about that the other day. How do you get that? Like, what do you do? What can be the accelerator? You know, that's a great question, Michelle. And I think the biggest thing you can start doing as a leader within a, a distributed organization is either empowering your workers to learn on their own time and really simply asking them the question, what do they want to learn? I think often you have HR leaders, business leaders create this grand learning program and they've never really even asked their people, what are you interested in learning? As in, what is the direction that you want to grow in your career? What soft skills matter? What behavioral skills matter? Or more importantly, you know, what technologies are you interested in that if we teach you, if we equip you with, if we, you know, maybe get you a subscription on, it'll lead you into the direction you want to take your career. So really doing the simple work is in asking and not necessarily just having to do a survey, because I think the first thing leaders jump to is let's do a survey. Let's analyze everybody within our organization and do a really robust survey and say, hey, you know, like have five questions, five no, 50 questions more like it and say, okay, what do you guys want to learn? We want to do this big, big survey around for you all so we can determine what you want to learn. Really just ask them directly, have their team leaders, have the managers, ask each individual, what are you interested in? And really start thinking about learning and development from a bottoms up approach versus a one size fits all approach. Mm. And I think one of the best examples I often give for this is Google. I think what Google does around learning and development is really interesting, interesting such as their learning and, and, uh, and their 20% 20, 20 uh, programs, right? 
Google's 20% programs essentially give their workers an opportunity to learn new skills by working on projects on the side, right? And that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't necessarily take any cost for Uber to offer. It's internal and it empowers their workers to determine, okay, what new projects can I learn if I'm working in can I learn a new project as a UX designer for maybe three months, right? Or can I work on a new project as a business analyst for three months and sharpen my skills on actual hands-on practical projects within the organization? That's a great L&D program that's empowering your workers to, you know, be curious and focus on what they want to learn. So really directly ask your people, what are you interested in learning? And then they'll pursue that. And I think, you know, now that we're in a distributed workforce, it's more important than ever for us to get a real genuine pulse on what our people want to learn. Mm -hmm. Thank Tim. So appreciative of your comments, Paul. I actually want to turn to you. We're getting we're getting some comments on the feed on the live feed, and a couple of them go back to what Kerry was talking about in terms of this remote workforce. And some people have asked two things very specifically. One, how do companies and can organizations transition from a more physical environment, which many still are, to this virtual remote work environment? And two. Some people are saying they're hearing through the grapevine that people are actually bringing people back into the office because there's been lack of collaboration in these more virtual environments. So I know I hit you up with two things, but I always love to address our live audience um, in terms of what's on their minds and what our expertise can and address for them. So Paul, can you chime in on that? Yeah, I, I would say over the past four months, I, I moved from 20 years in, in big tech going to hour long meetings nonstop and sending 150 emails a day to a, a world that's Slack and Zoom. And if I send an email, I made fun of. And so, you know, I, I worked very hard when I was at Microsoft to, to drive an on demand program and really start to experiment with remote work. I think there's, there's two things in your question. Um, you know, what can organizations do? And I think the first thing that's important in any organization is to find a group that is passionate and progressive about remote work and on demand and start a program. Really lean in. It's not an option. Find a, find a senior manager that wants to reskill his team and wants to work differently. And then really lean in and use that as a place to pilot. Then take those learnings and spread it throughout the organization. I think a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, Bob or Judy or someone, you know, they had a need to work at home and we tried it. It didn't work. It's not going to work for our organization. And, you know, the, my personal belief, and I'm sure Carrie would, would agree and, and the others, is that if you don't have a remote program, if you're not teaching people how to work in this way, you're doing them a disservice. You're actually causing your employees to atrophy and not be competitive in the market and the way trends are moving. And so I advocate you know, remote work as a way to reskill. I, I want to speak to something Tim talked about, and Michelle, we talked about it um, on the pre-call, is you know, I believe in big programs are going to be hard. You could sign a Coursera or LinkedIn learning thing and give everybody, you know, the, the, the videos, and I want to go be an AI person, and maybe I get halfway through and realize I'm not going to be an AI person. Um, but the biggest thing is learning by doing. We're moving into a space where you're going to learn through experimentation. You're going to learn, and everybody likes growth mindset. They like the success of growth mindset. They don't like the failure part of growth mindset. In fact, I don't think I've met a lot of managers that you know, believe in growth mindset and have diversity and inclusion meetings. But man, when it comes to failing, when it comes to, hey, we made a mistake, that's kind of when the growth mindset goes out of the, out of the you know, yeah, and rails and says, oh, well, we have KPIs. And so, look, I, I firmly and, and I advocate for side hustles. And I know side hustles are called moonlighting. And I know that every employment contract that most people you know, run into has a moonlighting agreement. And so I think as, as HR leaders, it's really important to understand. I think the latest report I saw said 65% of all employees have a side hustle. Mm -hmm. Yet that side hustle is in complete contrast to the employment agreement that they signed that said they're not allowed to have a side hustle. And so it's these kinds of things when I talk to HR leaders are saying, hey, don't you want to support? Now, look, if somebody's doing something competitive, if somebody's stealing IP, if those things are real. I'm not advocating for unethical behavior in the workforce at all. 
But everyone has passions outside of work. And so to embrace the full employee, to make sure that they're reskilling, you really need to understand, and that's not an LMS system. That's not a, a bunch of videos that you sort of gave everybody a subscription to. to. To Tim's point, everybody gets to choose where their passion is and where their career is because companies no longer guarantee a path. No matter how much the career ladders and the structures and all the meetings, that career path is not guaranteed anymore. Generation Z and Y understand that. And, you know, the later generations are starting to understand that as well and reacting and starting to have a choice. Mm -hmm. Paul, I just want to let you know, you're getting some great feedback from our live audience. People love the atrophy comment that you made and apprenticeships that you're commenting on. So thank you for those insights. Diane, I want to bring in here another thing that, um, and, I'm, and to the, our audience, if we end up jumping to another topic, uh, you know, we're not going deep enough. We certainly are going to try to do that, but we want to get a lot of information into your hands if we can today. And with that, Diane, and I think you can address this, you know, there was a couple of people commenting, and I have this question as well, because my company focuses on growth enterprises and the middle market. And the middle market isn't necessarily all that sexy in terms of the kinds of companies that make up the middle market. But people are asking, you know, the average company, the tech tsunami that's, you know, already here, is it really happening in those average companies and if not, what, what do they need to do? How can they get on board? Are they gonna get left behind? Will they be out of business? And I know I'm talking you know, a swath of industry, but I'm just curious what your take is on that. Yeah, yeah, the, the tech tsunami is real and, and it really will affect everyone or is affecting everyone, whether you're you know, a smaller organization trying to grow or a middle-sized organization um, serving as a supplier to a larger organization, or you're a larger organization that's trying to re refit or retrofit your existing operations. Um, the, the tech tsunami is, is something that, that basically business leaders everywhere in every sector and every size organization is trying to figure out what digital means for them and what digital means for their employees and make smart choices um, mm -hmm. you know, within that environment because the tsunami is speeding up markets and you have to pace with the markets mm -hmm. in a way that is tech enabled. But, but that said, most, most executives are a little bit myopic, myopic focusing on the tech and not on the talent. Mm -hmm. And we, we need a more balanced equation. And, um, and we need to understand that that what really matters is the talent side of the equation, because if we don't get the talent side right, tech doesn't matter. Um, yeah, yeah, so, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the talent strategies are, um, are really exciting, right? This is a huge opportunity for all of us. It's an opportunity for us to elevate, right, the, the human condition within, within our organizations, but we have to be thoughtful, we have to be um, artful, and we have to be proactive. And um, I think we, we have a lot of great recommendations kind of on the, uh, on the panel so far, but um, you can take big swings and make big impact, but you know, there are a lot of things that we can do to get started today, walking mm -hmm. out of the call today. And we need to start doing that collectively and, and share our experience so that we can mm -hmm. all kind of learn from each other and help each other. So, you know, one thing that I just want to um, bring out to everyone, because we're getting some thumbs up on the middle market from some of our audience is, and then Tim, I, I want to go to you um, and carry on something is, you know, in our work, because that's the organizations that we cater to, that we do leadership and HR consulting with, our view as a company is we need to bring to those organizations the freshest and most on-trend ideas. They have the right of refusal if it can't certainly fit yet into their environment, but certainly raising the awareness in the middle market. And that to me is getting the workforce ready, is raising the awareness of tools, um, initiatives, approaches that are already in place in maybe larger organizations that have the infrastructure and the dollars to support. But there is no reason that any of us shouldn't be introducing these ideas and concepts into all kinds of organizations. And then of course, understanding if they're ready or not to take on some of those uh, implementations from whatever we're recommending. 
But with that, Tim, I'm so curious because what you're, you know, your big role here is with the We Company. Um, sort of a mixed bag these days with the news to, to, to comment, right? No one's naive to what's True. going on in the work. Um, but that said, what I'm curious about, because certainly a lot of our audience are HR practitioners in a variety of senses, is what are you seeing that HR can do to get out of the way, which I know Paul likes to talk about, of some of these advancements? Because I believe I'm an HR professional for a very long time that we at times can really be in the way mm. and yet we're in such the sweet spot right now to actually drive a lot of these changes. Can you talk like what's happening in the we company? What are you seeing? What's your thoughts on that? Michelle, that's an amazing question. Thank and, and, well, you. <laughs> usually, and I think it's amazing because you're right. I think HR leaders are in an amazing position to get out of the way, but yet sometimes you see HR try to force, I think, this revolution, in my opinion, upon workers when they're already grasping to and they're already latching to it and they're asking for it, you know, internally, but sometimes they're not being listened to is often what I like to say. And I think we're moving from a era of just employee engagement and employee experience to now really thinking, how do you personalize everything for the employee? Yeah. Meaning you're equipping them and you're putting them in a position of control on how they work, where they work, why they work, how they want to grow. And for, from a WeWork angle, for us, it's really thinking about flexible workspace, right? Mm -hmm. This really big buzzword that people still don't get it. Like, is it just like, is it adapting your workspace? Is it, you know, moving chairs here and there? And really simply put, flexible workspace is similar to having an employee be able to use Slack, right? It's essentially creating a workspace designed around how people behave. One of the things that's really powerful about WeWork is that we do actually use data to drive how we design spaces, mm -hmm. right? So just that small piece, right? Being able to use data to understand how people move through space, when people work best, what type of atmospheres people work best. That's something we work, we provide to our customers as an enterprise advantage and we actually have a workplace strategy team that usually works with companies such as a Microsoft and Amazon, uh, Uber, on what are the needs of your specific team, whether it be you're maybe you're building an innovation hub or you're building a, you know, uh, you're trying to own an entire building. How can we design a space intentionally tailored to your teams and how they want to work, right? And you often find that in the work that we're doing with these companies, you can have a variety of different spaces. You can have meeting spaces where mm -hmm. people probably are more intentional to come to meet. And that's often near the kitchen. And when you, when you have these people meeting in these areas, what you get is you start getting collaboration. They're starting mm -hmm. to talk more. And it's not just open space. It's more so an agile um, work format where there are spaces where you can meet. There are spaces where you can study. There are spaces where you can be heads down and focused, such as working in a booth. So it's really thinking about well, now that we've kind of customized how people work using SaaS software, right? It's not just a, a bunch of legacy systems anymore. You can now automate your work in Slack. Well, think about that same kind of mindset, that same type of ethos in the workspace. And yeah. when you give your people that, and as an HR leader, you completely say, well, let's completely just rethink how our people work. You now start to see, well, people are going to want to come to work more when you have that kind of space. But more importantly, it actually nurtures innovation. It's not, it doesn't nurture static thinking. Well, I, I want to jump in, Tim, because we're yeah. I think we're contradicting ourselves here a little bit yeah. as a panel. So I just want to pull that out in case anybody listening is going, wait a minute, uh, I'm not sure where they're going here. So I don't disagree with you because mm -hmm. I I'm on the board of a uh, architectural design furniture company that is the premier distributor of Steelcase. Yes. And having been at the Steelcase headquarters in Michigan, what I found fascinating was one of their floors has a variety of different kinds of workspaces depending on how I'm feeling that day. So mm. when I come in, hey, I can work in a number of different parts of the floor. However, Kerry <laughs> and Paul and even Diane, we were just talking about remote programs and that Kerry's never had a desk, right? So. So I think I, I don't disagree, but yet if we're now talking about virtual workforces, we don't 
we're not necessarily going to use the space, although, of course, what we work is doing is providing space for us virtual people, right, is providing spaces for those of us who aren't necessarily in a headquartered company and doesn't, doesn't have the physical space anymore. But I just wanted to call out that difference, right? And I, Paul, did you get your finger up on that if you want to try? I, I, there's, a, there's a really important point here. And I, and I, I want every HR practitioner on the call to, to sort of understand it. HR has a choice right now. They can either be in the control and compliance business, which I understand there's a lot of HR organizations that uh, run compliance. They have policies. They're in control. Their job is to make sure that all the employees are compliant. Uh, and their job is to control with their business partners of the organization and, and reduce as much risk as possible. I, I respect and I understand that role. It's, a, it's an important one. I also think there's a choice of HR leaders of is there a role for somebody to be progressive and say, my job is actually to empower the employees and, and to unleash them within rough bounds. And how can I both protect the company from risk and fully empower employees and give them a choice. Because Michelle, to your point, we're actually talking about the same thing. Whether Carrie and I, like you know, to Tim's point, if I'm feeling good today, I'm in my office. Tomorrow I might work from my kitchen. The next day I might work from the garden. So I, I kind of have my own WeWork space. And by the way, Tim, I'm happy to lease it to a Wee company for what we're talking about. <laughs> they but, might need your help. <laughs> <laughs> Just I, think, I think that the fundamental point is our organizations trying to control and drive compliance and reduce risk at all costs. Or as Tim says, with Google and their 20% and a lot of other organizations, are they trying to empower people and educate them where the boundaries are and keep the company safe, which is, which is equally important. And in my experience, I've found that HR a number of times goes back to their comfort zone. I've got a bunch of policies. It's my job to, to drive compliance to those policies. And I, I guard the fort and protect it from, from all evil. And, you know, I, I think, you know, Tim and Carrie and, and Diane, all of us said, HR is in an amazing position right now, mm. where human capital is the most important thing for every company. We're in the talent economy. Everybody says the same thing. And here's HR. And that's why I'm so passionate about the work Enrique is doing with hacking HR, because HR is an amazing app now. It requires risk. To be an HR person, to go over your skis, to be progressive, to have ideas and support on-demand programs, remote programs, you know, programs where, where you support side hustles. I can't imagine being an HR practitioner and walking in to my boss and to a staff meeting and saying, I've got an idea, let's do this. But it's what's required. Yeah. And you know, that's my point of view. I, I, and I believe that either you're going to help enable and empower the future, or you need to kind of step back and, and, and let somebody who is going to help reskill the workforce, because otherwise you're going to end up with, like I said, large amounts of people who are not going to have the skills to stay relevant over the next five or 10 years. And as an HR team, you don't want to deal with that problem either. And yeah. so at this point in time, every HR person has a choice to make. In my opinion. Yeah, and, you know, Diane, I'm going to bring I you in. we ask something? Uh, so, go ahead, Tim. I'm sorry. Thank you so much, Michelle. And I think a big part of the, and I think flexible workspaces and thinking about a distributed workforce, I think, you know, it's people We're now we work is not transitioning to really creating a revolution around on demand workspaces. And one of the biggest, I think, enablers to upskilling and reskilling or even giving people that confidence to, to grow and learn is giving them control of where and when they work. So, and that's what on-demand and flexible workspaces do. But I think it just nurtures this notion of psychological safety, right? Where you don't have to be in a workspace or you don't have to, you can choose to work from home and maybe watch a YouTube video, right? On one of these big topics that you're learning for a big project or something, right? Or you can go into the WeWork space and meet some of your teammates and actually talk about that project, right? So like when you have flexible work styles and you actually are creating an environment around it, I actually think that drives learning output because it, it, it creates comfort. So I think I love a lot of what uh, you and, uh, and Paul are saying, but I, I, I do think that we're all aligned on we're moving towards a distributed workforce. Yeah, and I think, and Diane, I'm going to get to you in one second. What I just want to, I was just walking up Sixth Avenue to get to where I am in New York City, for those of you who know New York. And what caught my eye is I passed a store 
that is a complete experience store in terms of men's clothing. So what they had was on the mannequins, they had displayed some suits and shirts and so forth, but on the wall was the fabric choices that you could pick to put together your personal jacket, shirt, whatever it might be. I didn't have time to stop in because I was rushing to get here to be able to moderate today. But to me, and because I, some of our audiences go, you know, it's, it's touching a little bit on that queasiness around too much customization in the workplace. But yet, if you think about my phone, Paul's phone, Diane's phone, Carrie's phone, Tim, your phone, every single one of our phones is going to have a swath of different applications, apps on it, right? That Paul has his preferences. I have my preferences. We might have some overlap. Maybe a few things are the same. But we've personalized our phone to make it work for us. So I certainly know that this is a very hard thing for, for, you to, for us to get our heads around for organizations in terms of that kind of personal customization. But if we're doing it in the consumer side, then it certainly is going to happen in the workplace side. And so, Diane, what I'm curious about from you is, could you maybe give us one or two real examples from the work that you're doing? where you've seen any of this customization happening in a very successful way or where their things have stalled a bit? Because I'd love to hear you, I'd love to give our audience actual examples. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, um, magic happens when, when you do this and when you get this right. I, I have seen um, really inspiring examples where, um, where you put the tools in place, right? Um, you you establish a, a level of connectivity uh, across a highly distributed team, right? One that, that might be spread, spread across the world, right? Um, never in the same room, but if you give them the tools to collaborate virtually, and uh, if you, um, again, once again, using platform capabilities mm -hmm. and an ecosystem mindset, right? You, you start to connect the uh, the team right and their experiences their aspirations and their goals in a way that that starts to convert their operations from team operations and work assignments to community operations right mm -hmm. in a collective effort right if you start to wrap a a team i've seen you know once again a very specific example where we had a globally distributed team they had a very aggressive goal and they needed the help of people that they had never worked with, never met in order to succeed against that goal. And by using technology to connect these people, the information they needed to make decisions, uh, the, the learning information that they needed to understand the new capabilities and the new goals, the collaboration technology that they needed to connect with one another, share ideas, share projects, share materials. Um, I've seen this team, this globally distributed team of teams come together as a community with one shared goal, one mission. Uh, that shared goal, that mission started to unlock their aspirations and their passions. Mm -hmm. And they were able to come together on their own terms and drive that goal to completion. In this particular goal was a 10-year goal and they were able to drive that goal to completion in nine months rather than 10 years. Mm -hmm. so, so you're, you're wow. able to, right, if you establish the trust, the connectivity, the, um, you know, the shared mission and you empower the teams to bring their whole self, right, their mm -hmm. passions, their experience, their aspirations, their learning goals, and connect in a way that is not threatening, but is mutually supportive, you can actually unlock a, just a whole new level of performance and engagement and inspiration. Again, converting teams into communities. Mm. So it's, um, you know, you, you have to get the conditions right. And, yeah. and that's not easy. There, there is a, a work system that you have to put in place to make that all happen. Mm -hmm. but, but you do unlock magic when you're able to do that. Carrie, I'm going to have you, because um, I saw you nodding along there. What I'm curious about is for SAP, again, very large global organization, what are one or two things maybe that you've been surprised by that SAP has been able to accomplish 
in terms of really being in the now of work. And then once we finish with Carrie, uh, team, I'm going to go start going around because we obviously have a lot still to share with our audience and start getting the one or two things that our audience could actually action today or next week from this conversation. I want to make sure we get to that before we wrap up in about 10, 15 minutes. So Carrie, if, what's maybe one or two surprises for you in SAP that you've been able to grapple with maybe more fluidly than you thought? I'd say one of the things is really changing who our workforce is. So we used to be average age 48, we're down to 41. Um, our New York office average age is 36. A uh, whole lot more hipsters there than necessarily in some of our other offices. But if you think of, you know, historically we were a, a pretty homogeneous engineering type audience. Um, we're far more diverse both in age as well as profile now. And that is something that has come out of a lot of intentional programs to introduce new talent to the organization. Um, I also think that, frankly, right now, one of the urgent things is how do we manage late talent or experienced talent as well. I think I want to bring a few things together and I'll sort of start your run around of, of some ideas I've been listening to. We spent some time, um, we hosted a house at South by Southwest this year. And one of the roles, we talked about the resume of the future. And one of the roles is a passion broker. And that's something that I think HR is really becoming. How do you connect people in ways that they can be most powerful and thrive for the most amount of time. Uh, I'll give an example at Lululemon. They actually, as employees, they ask, where do you want to be in five years? And even if that isn't with Lululemon, they want to figure out how do you thrive while you're here so that we get the most out of you while you're in our organization. And yeah. they encourage people to invent their own new jobs within the organization and propose them. And when you look at the fact that average tenure is sitting around you know, two to three years, depending on what study you read, how to get people to be productive is key. Um, like with Tim, I've worked with a number of organizations who have looked at their own workspaces, um, Daimler, Pfizer, ExxonMobil, and ExxonMobil, for example, they used to think an employee was fully baked to eight years. They've gotten it down to six, and they're aiming for four to be more in line with how long people work for. Mm -hmm. Some other ideas that I want to think uh, speak to that you mentioned also, Michelle, is you know, the moments that matter. So when you think about the consumer experience, the you know, first industrial revolution looked at how do we get consistency and predictability and quality. And where we are now is that was taking variability out. We now can use data to have that variability from a personal perspective that speaks to all of what Tim and Paul and, Mich and Diane were saying of how do we get what we want when we want it in a way that suits us best will keep mm -hmm. us retained for as long as possible and so when you think about the experience it's beyond the survey for sure Tim I agree you know, but being able to look at employee sentiment in the same way as you look at consumer sentiment mm -hmm. that you're getting feedback from your employees on an active basis but that experience lends itself to getting the same kind of loyalty out of an employee that you're trying to look for in a consumer Mm -hmm. So that's really, I, I think, a, a shift in terms of where we're all headed that brings together a lot of those, those aspects. Um, one other thing I'd just say, too, is when you look at learning and talent, you know, I see a lot of areas, to Paul's earlier point of your brand, people are inventing themselves at a much younger age and reinventing themselves ongoing. So you've got people able with robotics or media to enter into the workforce without even going to school as they're coming out of as teenagers with the brand or the capabilities or knowledge to do jobs that don't necessarily require for, our, for your degree. And so for learning, I think it also becomes incumbent upon us to say, what is it we need to teach? And it's interesting when you look at the World Economic Forum and things companies need to tackle around creativity and grit and problem solving okay. and communication that are other kinds of skills that you're learning as life skills. Um, you know, I know one organization, uh, VaynerMedia, looked at a lot of uh, learning around feedback because they had a lot of young talent who hadn't necessarily looked at feedback as a gift. So their chief heart officer, Claude Silver, said they did a whole program on how do we better interact um, remotely or otherwise, but communicate in a way that you're driving success. So just a bunch of thoughts in there, but I, I think as we, um, to, uh, to Diane's point of, you know, is technology everywhere? Yes. And I think the puzzle of, you know, where does machine learning, blockchain, AI, robotics, all that come in? 
what does that mean for retail versus CPG versus manufacturing? And how do our jobs change? And that litmus test of how do jobs change, I think for HR to say, what's our business roadmap, you know, to that 10 year plan that you can do in nine months? How does technology help that? And how can we look at the, the Goldilocks sweet spot that we leverage the change of our people along with the change of technology, whether it's a remote space, uh, headquarters space, how do we bring talent together so it thrives for the most time possible given we're going to have people for less time going forward. Yeah, and 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 I think you're you're I mean you're right about that. I agree with everyone. <laughs> Just ditto, ditto, ditto. Um, a couple of things that I'm watching on the live feed. Excuse me, and Paul, then I'm going to get to you for the two points, and Diane, and then Tim, just so you know the order that we're going to go in. But, you know, what's interesting is someone brought up, you know, what about the manufacturing industry? Like, because that's sort of, you know, a stronghold in our country for if, if you're in the United States and certainly around the world. So I had an experience a couple of years ago. I was out in the Midwest where we have quite a bit of business, and I ended up visiting the manufacturing plant for a particular company. I won't name the company. And I got to tell you, I, I wanted to get out of there as fast as possible. It was dingy. It was dark. It was not at all inviting. Um, I was concerned that they were violating a lot of things, but that's neither here nor there. And then two days later, my husband and I took a tour of the F-150 Ford plant. Mm -hmm. And the contrast between these two organizations was staggering to me. The Ford plant was high, high, high ceilings, brightly lit robotics and people assembling the, the F-150, right? So here you're bringing in te new technology, robotics, people are interacting in a different way. And then what I would consider an old and staid environment. And again, I get it, middle market, not always the money that a Ford has, but I sure. think that's the stark differences in terms of what are some of the moves that HR can influence, even if you're not in a Ford and have those kind of dollars available, but what can you do to influence those kinds of environments? And just to our audience, we're just not going to be able to touch upon everything. I see some comments that, you know, we're not getting to the multi-generational and so forth. There are lots of panels today on this summit that Enrique has put together for Hacking HR. Hopefully one of those other panels will touch upon a few things that maybe our panel is not. But thank you so much for your comments. Paul, one or two things that our audience can do. Well, first of all, everything comes in three. So I, I, <laughs> I want to address something you said, you know, empathy and creating a safe work environment that empowers people doesn't cost anything. And so I think when you, when you look at this space and you ask an HR person, you know, what could they do? How do I provide a safe place for people to do work? And how do I realize that my job isn't to keep them here for eight years because they're not going to? You have to, you have to internalize these statistics of people having side hustles, people staying for two years and realizing that you are taking care of an employee while they are providing service to your organization and you have a responsibility as they move on. And, and I don't think a lot of people have digested because their lived experience was very different than a lot of people's lived experiences now. And, and to a lot of us, we, we sort of find safety and comfort in our lived experiences. Real quickly, three very specific things that any HR practitioner could leave this call and do. Number one is go and look at your moonlighting and side hustling policy. Go look at that policy and say, hey, is that in line with how people are learning today and how we want to treat our employees? And are there things we can do to celebrate the diversity of thought, the diversity of experience, and what people are doing outside of work and bring those learnings in and be more fluid in that conversation? Number two is start an on-demand program. If your organization does not have a pilot or an on-demand program with companies like TopTal, with companies like Upwork, with companies like Business Talent Group, uh, We Are Rosie, The Mom Project, and many, many, many more, go out, reach out to those companies and do a project. That's the first step in understanding that there is a workforce around the United States and around the globe that can provide value on a project basis to your organization. The third thing I would say, and, and Carrie hit on this, and I think it's extremely important. When we talk about diversity and inclusion, we often limit the conversation to race, religion, and sex. And by the way, I think there are a, there's a ton of work that organizations need to do to catch up in those spaces. So I'm not discounting those efforts. 
but you have to add diversity of thought. You have to start looking at different people who have different skills and putting them in organizations. I spent a long time in an organization that believed you fit in one of three boxes. You are a developer, you are a PM, or you are a designer. If you weren't in one of those boxes, then you couldn't be helpful to the organization as it stood and as it was. And so I'm a big advocate of, you know, really lean in and understand the power of diversity of thought when you look at diversity and inclusion. And a lot of that will lead you to wanting to have a remote program. So those are three very specific. Ex Paul, spot on and excellent for being so specific. Diane and Tim, then we're going to come to you. Um, yeah. This job gets harder as the as the uh, recommendations kind of get to the uh, the back of the list. So um, I'm going to say ditto a lot here, but uh, but yeah. So just to maybe just reconfirm, we are living in the talent economy. We're living in the experience economy, right? You know, it, we are living in a very different world. And um, we're leading in a very different world than our parents' generation was, and um, and we have to we have to act we have to think very differently today. Um, we can't just all be heads down focusing on you know getting the job done. We have to be heads up and horizon watching, right? We have to be experts in our our profession, but we also have to be progressive and open in our thinking. And uh, and so I would say. You know, first and foremost, if you haven't already, shift your mindset, right? Mm -hmm. Start thinking in a way that that embraces the open economy, right? The the talent economy, and understand that talent has a voice, it has a choice, and very often, more more often than not, employees are pursuing portfolio careers, mm -hmm. right? Sixty percent is the main hustle, thirty percent is the side hustle, ten percent is the learning hustle. And that can be good for you, wow. right? Yeah. right? That is um, an investment that your employees are making in their own gratification, their own learning, their own development, and you can benefit from that. So you should support that. So point number two, I very strongly agree with Paul. Start looking at those policies today, right? Take a look at those um, moonlighting policies. Take a look at the remote policies. And then thirdly, take a look at your... Um, basically your, your protocol for reaching out to distributed workers. What's your onboarding process for contract workers? What's your, your, uh, your access protocol for people who need access to the systems, but maybe you don't want to ship a, a laptop out to a freelancer? Have, have smart protocol in place so that your extended team, whether they're employees or freelancers or, or partners, can plug in and help you get jobs done at a moment's notice, right? Have the right compliance framework, the right technology framework, the right operational framework in place so you can flex out and flex in and depending on where you need expertise and when. And, uh, and really train and equip your, your own team, your employees for success in this, um, in this experience economy and the talent economy give them the, um, the confidence that they understand how to engage the right expertise in the right way uh, to, to get the job done. So, the, you know, I know- Diane, thank you. Excellent, yeah. spot mm -hmm. on and very specific. And Tim, we still have a few minutes left, so plenty of time for um, a couple of comments from you, and then we'll just do the quick uh, 30 second wrap up from everyone. But Tim, yeah. what are a few things that you think people that are listening to us today, you know, we've got a broad range of participants that they could action, whether it be today, next week, or in the next month, <laughs> that could actually contribute this readiness of our entire workforce? Absolutely. I do have a strong one, and I believe it's around creating a learning culture. So mm -hmm. as the CEO of Guide and a life skills training app for high school students, one of the things that I've been very adamant about is creating a culture around learning. So within our Slack group, we have an actual channel where people can share their daily learnings. So not just learnings that they're getting, you know, by, because we're a distributed team, not learnings like on the job, but also in their personal life as well. And that's a part of our mission to create a learning culture because we're a learning-centered company that's building a learning product. So I encourage, you know, some of the HR leaders currently listening and watching right now, 
How can you do that within your organization? Could it be you just creating a Slack channel where employees feel safe to share their mistakes, right? What they're learning on the job or new things that they're learning watching YouTube or in their role. So they can also, also, they can also share those learnings with everyone, not just keep it to themselves, but really creating that ethos and that culture within your organization that really drives this idea that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to share what you're learning, and more importantly, that people are going to hold you accountable and encourage you to learn more. You'll be surprised, you'll go into a lot of different cultures, it's super toxic, and it doesn't nurture learning. And then you think about, yeah. why do people go to work? People yeah. Go they to work to grow to progress to feel as if they're you know they're learning so why aren't cultures designed around that versus just output and you know being very task oriented so that's one practical tip i think a lot of the hr listening will love you know the thing that i'm going to add and then just be ready i'm not going to call on each of you but if you raise your hand i'll get to you i'd love to give since this is the hacking hr community i'd love to give our audience a hack from today's session so with that said, though, one of the things I certainly have, you know, really worked hard on for myself and with my team is how am I upskilling myself? Like, what am I doing? So, for, you know, we keep talking to the HR professionals, what they have to do for others. But what are you doing for yourself to ensure that you're getting more up to date, more on trend, more exposed to what's going on today? Right. And for me, it's taking things like there's a course out there from Jeannie Meister that's called AI for HR. It's an online learning course. And by the way, you learn about this new learning platform, how that works, plus a lot of new applications in the AI and machine learning space. So for me, that was a way where I'm making sure that I'm fresh in my own knowledge and my conversation. So I think that that's just something that everyone can think of and that you can ask yourself the question, what did you do today to really participate in how work is functioning today. So just that simple question is a great question for all of us to ask ourselves because I always look at it, we've got to go first and then we can ask others to come with us. I'd love a hack, either one or two from our group. Paul, I think you had your hand up for a hack. So Do you Carrie, have a hack? In all honesty, Carrie did first, so go ahead, Carrie. Oh, Carrie, a hack. Maybe one that I came across, uh, there's a group called creativemornings.com. And they meet once a month. There's about 200 chapters worldwide. And it's actually a group that's for those who are in the design or media or um, art, if you will. But it's kind of like a mini TED Talk, but it gives me a pulse on what people are thinking about and wow. what people are, are caring about. And it's, so it's a great way to stay current. Excellent. Paul, we've got 30 seconds for your hack. My hack is really simple. Tim will appreciate it. I produce content. And so if you want to hear my podcast, which, which you know, covers this topic every week, it's the thetaleneconomy.podcast.com. You can see it. You can uh, check it out on staffing.com. And I also every week produce a newsletter on LinkedIn. Uh, I think we have almost 25,000 subscribers. And so that's, producing that content is one of the ways that I stay current and really help to push forward the conversation. Excellent. Panel, I think we're, that's a wrap. Thank you for a really excellent, engaging conversation. And for everyone who's listening, so appreciative of your chiming in and giving us things to address. And stay tuned for the next panel starting at 1230, a sense of urgency. How do you accelerate everything that we're talking about? And so that panel will address all of that. And enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you Ooh. so much. Thank, Thank you, Paul. And Bye, y'all.